Coming up on this episode, we're going to hear from authors Frederick Smith and Chaz Lamar Cruz about their new book, Busy Ain't the Half of It. Welcome to episode 337 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. I'm Jeff, and with me as always is my co-host and husband, Will. Hello, Rainbow Romance readers. We are so glad that you can join us for another episode of the show. All right, we're going to dive right into our interview segment. This is a first for us because it's a conversation that neither of us are actually a part of. I attended an Instagram Live on September 19th featuring Frederick Smith and Chaz Lamar Cruz in conversation with Adriana Herrera. These are three of my favorite authors in one spot, so of course I couldn't pass that up. Plus, I was reading Fred and Chaz's book, Busy Ain't the Half of It, which, as you may have heard back in episode 336, I absolutely adored that book. Their conversation was excellent. Not only did Fred and Chaz talk about their book and their second time co-writing, but the conversation also went into topics about diversity, intersectionality, and queer persons of color in books and media. I loved the discussion so much that as soon as it was done, I emailed the three of them asking if we could feature it here. And thankfully, they said yes. So here we go with Frederick, Adriana, and Chaz. And I hope you find this conversation as enjoyable and meaningful as I did. Thank you for joining us or, ha- or, or having us, hosting us, being with us, talking with us today and everything. Thank you for um, inviting me. And thank you for sending me a copy of your amazing, super fun book. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's been out for about a month now, and we are touring until the wheels fall off, as they say. (laughs) And you know that life, too. And Chaz and I know that life. We've been busy for the past six weeks and everything. Yeah, yeah. And how, well, I guess I I wanted to ask, how is it co-writing? Because I've never co-written before. And I'm considering it. I have a friend that we've been kind of thinking about a story idea and we have never done it and it's a queer story so cool so i was wondering how it's been because this is your second book that you guys write together right yes yeah chaz you want to share how it's been for you it's been great i think it's important to come up with a plan of how you're going to approach the writing Mm -hmm. works for fred and i is both of our novels follow two main characters and then we take lead on the world of those characters mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's the the responsibility we have and then we have conversations about which direction they may go and how their lives are going to intertwine or not and so when you're writing together i think it's best to come up with a plan of how to approach it yes yeah although i mean that's smart like you because we're thinking of doing like a, a romance so it would be like a couple so they would have one character and I would have the other character. So it would be a little different because then there's like dual POVs. Like, how would we do it? Uh Uh-huh. And you got to figure out the interactions when they do interact together because those chapters might have to be written together together. when they're doing, when they have, when they meet and come together and stuff. But like for our first novel, Co-writing actually was really natural because Chaz and I have known each other for many years okay. as both friends and as co-workers and colleagues and just we've we just known each other for a while and we know each other's families and everything and so coming together to write was just really like an extension of all that we have um, kind of known in our lives and everything yeah. and the first novel we wrote together which is called in case you forgot it came pretty organically we we would meet on saturdays we were both living in los angeles at the time mm-hmm. and we would both meet at the west hollywood library and on saturday mornings and we would like rent out one of those like study writing rooms and things mm-hmm. like that and then we would just write together on a cloud And it came pretty organically. Mm -hmm. And so that first novel we did together came pretty well. But then the second novel, well, Busy Ain't the Half of It, which we worked on together, had to be a little bit different because um, (laughs) I took on a new position. I moved to a new city. My new position did not give me as much writing time or flexibility Mm -hmm. um, as I had with In Case You Forgot. And so Chaz took charge and was like, Fred, look, we got outline um, (laughs) because I can't be sitting waiting to start on my chapters when 
you know, you're busy doing work and busy yeah. doing all this other stuff and everything. And so I really appreciated. And so like Chad showed earlier, plan and outlining really helped. Naturally, though, when I'm writing and I don't know how it is for you, I'm a, what do they call it? A, a, a pantser? A pantser, so, yeah. A pantser, yeah. So I tend to just write as the characters kind of go. speak to me and they go. And that's how we did for the, for, in case you forgot, but for Busy Ain't the Half of It, Chaz was like, Brett, you can't keep up. <laughs> We got to outline. <laughs> you need to make a plan. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm a plot, sir. Like, I do plot. I do a lot of, like, planning before I do start writing. But I usually throw out the plot, like, within, like, the end of the first act. Like, usually by the time I get to, like, the end of the second act, it's, like, completely different from what I envisioned. <laughs> but it works. I mean, I... It's like a roadmap, but I usually end up taking uh -huh, like uh -huh. all different roads what I initially envisioned. But it does yeah. help to have an outline. Like that's the stuff that definitely like work co-writing. Like you would have to have some kind of plan because you can't just go off like <laughs> on your own. Absolutely. <laughs> we, we we have an outline with in case you forgot. We were just vibing out. Um, mm. But also writing together though, by the, like writing at the same time. Yeah, person. well, yes, yeah, so that you were kind of like, I mean, like, that literally physically being together, I bet also, because yep. you can work out a lot of, like, well, this is interesting, let's go, like, chase after that, but I assume, like, although with Zoom now and everything, like, I've been, since the pandemic started, I've been writing with two, with three friends, three author friends in the mornings, okay. and that has been really useful because even though we can't do like in person we hadn't been able to do in person things for such a long time we could at least virtually see each other and that did that did help because i mean sometimes it is important to just like talk things out with other authors but right? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like i'm stuck or oh that's or something. really cool so you all kind of do like a virtual writing group together where you're like it's your writing time and you're on zoom together Yes, oh, yes. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, and it's been great because I've been writing a historical romance this year and it's been a struggle. And so they've really helped me when I'm like, I, I'm going to throw this book against the wall. And they're uh -huh. like, no, maybe you could do this, you could do that. Or like, how about this? Because going into a, a whole new genre is is different is uh -huh. it's, it's the learning curve like going from contemporary romance to historical romance where i have to think about things like facts <laughs> yes and like <laughs> like black people's legal rights and all these things okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. although my book is like set in the late 1880s in paris actually it's set at the 1889 world's fair okay and so it sat kind of later in the century where, like, you know, abolition, at least in the Dominican Republic, had happened for, like, 50 years. So it's, like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. kind of a generation and a half off of slavery. But still, like, you know, power dynamics and all yeah. these things with... So it's been interesting and challenging. But I'm excited to write the next one because that next one is a queer story. It's a lesbian couple. Yeah. Okay, oh, the one that you're about to co-write or you're thinking about co-writing? or No, the, this You're this standalone, one is, okay. Yeah, it's, it's, so this is historical, it's a historical series. So the next okay. book in the series is a lesbian couple. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay, okay. And, you know, we're still deciding if, so, you know, we, we, we've done the first, in case you forgot, and then the <laughs> second, busy at the half of it is out. We'll tell you all about that in just a second, but we're still figuring out what the third or next mm. extension may be on this because... You know, the first novel we did together, in case you forgot, we got feedback from people saying they really love this character, Elijah, who became mm. a central part of Busy Ain't the Half of It. And now we are hearing different feedback from people about which main or secondary characters they want to see in like a next book and everything. And so we're still thinking, but uh, we got to get a proposal out very soon to uh, bolster so then we can okay. start our outline and writing and everything. Are you guys continue to co-write or are you also doing solo projects we are doing solo projects it's been great to co-write with fred because you know fred has a career of solo projects before we started to write together but yes i'm currently working on this series called handsome 
And so the first season is on YouTube and on Instagram. And so we're working on writing the second season now. Other ideas of writing solo projects too. Yeah. And what's Handsome about? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Handsome follows the life of, well, the first season follows the life of one main character who's recently singled after being in a relationship for eight years and trying to figure out how to date again in a large city. Okay. And so second season will expand to three main characters, queer folks of color as they navigate their life of mm -hmm. dating careers in LA specifically. Yeah. Nice. I think one of the things I was thinking about earlier today when we were thinking, I was just like trying to think about other writers who are in queer romance while writing people of color. And they're not like, like specifically like romance and romance adjacent <laughs> fiction. And there, I mean, there's not as much as I'd like to see, at least in like mainstream publishing. But it is like I can think of names now, which I couldn't think like off the top of my head. I could think of yeah. like a few people because it's I mean, gay romance is like kind of like a, a big space. But mm -hmm. um, like people specifically black people are still not really a stronghold in there. Yeah. Right. Like, so I have a couple friends who are, so Rashid Darden, mm -hmm. who writes this wonderful series based at HBCUs, and it follows mm -hmm. queer college students. His series is wonderful. And then Fiona Zed um, yes. is another one. Yeah, Fiona Zed writes a lot of Black I... lesbian. I love Fiona's work and Cherie Greer and then uh, Rebecca as well, Rebecca Weatherspoon, you know, kind of like you, does a number of genres and, and goes from historical to contemporary to everything like that. Those are some of the ones that I, I think about, but yeah, I hear you like, and especially like when I look at some of the bookstagrammers and things like that, I see some books get a lot of praise and they get passed along through the information highway so to speak and everything and then it's like okay but there's a lot that there are some queer people of color black latinx who are writing queer romance that also need to be on that same you know super highway as well online yes i i have to say i've been like in a really dark place with like the book like how like, I think we were in a good place in terms of, like, conversations around diversity and the importance of, like, trying to be more intentional about centering stories with, like, Black authors, queer authors, Black queer authors, like, intersection people who are doing, like, intersections of experiences. And then I feel like the pandemic happened and then, like, I don't know. Like, I feel like it's, like, very mushy now. And and I've seen it specifically, like, with book talk. Like, I've been noticing that, like, a lot of the books that are getting a lot of, like, the hype are mm -hmm. not books that are by people of color. And I think it's something that has to be, like, like, we have to keep holding that because it's so easy for the tide to turn. And we were, like, oh, we were, like, really, like, having the conversation Mm -hmm. become really organic like the presence of like authors of color like needs to be something that like publicity and the bookstagrammers like intentionally put out there so I hope the conversation like like comes back to that because it can it like, needs to and it it's important to. yes yeah. and especially like when I think about like like the impact so I'm jumping in the music, but thinking about Lil Nas X a little bit, everyone, mm, I think, mm -hmm. loves Lil Nas X and how Lil Nas X is just pushing the boundaries yes. in terms of this is who I am, this is my music, this is who I am, accept me as I am. And I'm hoping that, you know, the same type of effect can happen with uh, Black queer authors as well. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting with him, right? Because I was just listening to it. I hadn't had a chance to listen to it, so I was listening to it yesterday. And he has the video for, gosh, the one with, like, the, it's just clips. Has the video come out, the one with him and the football player, then the locker room? Has the whole video come out? I haven't seen it yet. And I was just thinking, like, hey, what a time to be alive. Like, as a 43-year-old person who, at that age, was really, like, questioning, like, you know, in the 90s, like, coming off of the AIDS epidemic, living mm -hmm. in Dominican mm -hmm. Republic, 
knowing for sure I was bisexual and trying to date in in that space and imagine like just imagining what it would have been like to have a little nas x in my in my life like to be able to see that or mm -hmm. any of the other like queer artists queer writers like pose i mean just everything right and i think like we are in like a really important like it's it, we have a moment where there's like freedom and like joy too because i think that's i, I think the difference with little Nas x that's really like been like really hit me yesterday what i like this this boy like loves himself mm -hmm. like he loves who he is and he is just like being himself and in like this beautiful expressive way and even like five years ago like for a man like him to make art like some of it had to mm -hmm, be like mm -hmm. dark and painful and like he's just not doing that he's just like choosing joy and he's you know like that's like i think that's where like what we're doing in the fiction space where we are creating stories where like the joy is centered mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. like literary fiction can do what it does and like everybody can like get traumatized and suffer through the entire book but for <laughs> us to do that piece of it of just see like the lives of people being themselves and not having to like anchor it on like the bad stuff like i think that's that's what with little Nas X and thinking about that and like the kind of parallels with with fiction like romantic fiction mm -hmm. i listened to his whole album by the way yeah We're i listened to it too yeah. little Nas X the whole time but his album is excellent <laughs> it's really good and you bring up a good point i think his album it explores his life like the complexities of his life, but he doesn't just center on the pain. Yeah. He said, like you said, on the joy. And I think that's what Fred and I, we have done in our books too. Like our focal point is not the hardships of like existing, navigating heterosexism or navigating anti-blackness. Like it is a part of the fabric of our stories. Yeah. But you want to get a, um, a story full of pain. Yeah. And there's a place for that. But we're just choosing not to write that. Right, yeah. right. It can be there, but not like that's what it is. And exactly. I think that that to me is, I mean, I was thinking about Frank Ocean too. <laughs> like, I think for him, I wonder like what it is for him to see this new, new kid come into the scene like seven, eight years later and be able to just fully be. And like the beauty there is in that fact that that has happened. And also, like, the reality that even five years ago, like, 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 it was so hard for him to be out and to be part of, like, his identity as a person trying to make music, kind of like. And then, I mean, thinking about just, like, what this will do to hip-hop in general. Yes. I'm excited for the future. Me I'm too. excited for the future, too. And so, yeah, so that whole thread, especially with thinking about Black queer romance, you know, it is something that we definitely try to center. And so just a little bit about Busy Ain't the Half of It, you know, for those who have or have not read it yet, it's a contemporary male-male, second chance, friends to lovers, romance novel. And it has elements of family and found family and some savvy teens and what has been deemed um, Black excellence. And so Chaz and I both took lead on different characters. So I took lead on, so I'll, I'll talk through the character. I took lead on Justin Monroe who is a um, newscaster in Los Angeles, who is recently divorced from his wife of 20 plus years. He has two 16 year old twins, Justin Jr. and Justice. And after being released, so to speak, from the television station, because he was number one newscaster in Los Angeles. Now that he's no longer at the anchor desk, he feels free to explore his true sexuality because both him and his wife were kind of living and playing a role in terms of their marriage, in terms of kind of raising the white picket fence and the Volvo and things like that. And so Justin has a chance to find love in the second chapter of his life. And indeed he does, as all romances do. And then Chastic lead on Elijah Golden, who is... 
is Justin Monroe's nephew, who is also an actor, trying to get his big break in Hollywood. He's also the partner of Zaire James, who Zaire James was one of the main characters in our first novel, In Case You Forgot. So this novel, Busy in Behalf of It, explores the life of Elijah Golden holistically. And so Elijah has an array of friends, um, queer friends, and you see Elijah navigating different forms, kinds of relationships, and trying to negotiate who he is as he continues to explore as a person, as an artist, and as a partner. The story looks at secrets, and there's also travel in the story where things evolve in love and, and in friendship. Yeah. So Elijah Golden and Justin Monroe, Busy Ain't the Half of It, explores the life of this. And happy endings. Happily and ever happy after. Happy for now. Uh, happy for now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Wish her good too. Because Elijah's pretty young. Elijah exactly. is, is, is young and trying to get established. And, you know, his uncle, who's, who's this newscaster, is like, hey, look, I have all these contacts. Let me hook you up and get you into Hollywood. I know all these people, but Elijah, Elijah wants to follow his own path. And that's yeah. what everyone should be allowed to do, is to follow yeah. their own path and do it the way that they want to, even though there could be family members who could make the road easier for them. Yeah. One thing that I like, I'm not done with it, but one thing that I do love is like the relationship and between them. And also I, I do like, I love when I read a book about characters of color and like the social capital and like the mentorship and like the elder with a young person happens like without having to resort to like not that white people can't be helpful mm -hmm. because they can be but mm -hmm. it's the idea of of passing on right like passing on like the wisdom and the experiences and holding up the new coming generation and when mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i think that to me is also like really important about the, the stories that we write it's presenting communities of color that are not just you know kind of like grasping as straws like there's been like that there's like generational legacies that are coming in and that mm -hmm. it's like not like we're mm -hmm. not new here like you know mm -hmm. things have been happening and we have been doing things and we have we have something to pass on exactly. right and i think like being able to show that and not you know having to rely on social capital that has to come from another community because we don't have that in within and it's such an organic part of what is being part of, of a community of color uh-huh uh -huh. so exactly and you know and, and and those are some of the fun dynamics and some of the the great feedback we've gotten is that people have really enjoyed the, the family dynamics so, so yes. not just between Uncle Justin and nephew Elijah, but then also the extended family that they share in terms of Elijah's parents and grandparents and aunts. And then the, the, these teenagers who have their own world in the novel as well is something that has gotten some really great feedback in terms of the dynamics and the connections and just kind of seeing, you know, how open and, and honest and free everyone, you know, is and busy ain't the half of it. And so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I... Oh. Sorry, I, I, I just really like, I like that. Yes. I like that a lot about the book, yeah. Yes, I do too. And that was fun. That was different for us too. Well, no, in, in, in case you forgot, we also have those elements of family too and yeah. found family, but definitely family because, you know, one of the things that I think is important is, you know, kind of what we were alluding to earlier is that, yes, there are, you know, queer people of color who endure traumas, who endure, you know, and and, and, and we don't, disregard that or, or or we know those those are realities in so many people's lives but then also the other part is that you know centering joy living in yes. joy you know I, I know that back in the 80s and 90s with some of the stories that like elon harris told or james yeah. or hardy they were centered in the coming out piece and the mm -hmm. kind of the tragedy or the the sadness that can come with i don't want to say sadness the, the the angst that comes with the coming yeah out and piece. the isolation 
and the isolation and, you know, these characters live full lives with their families. They're not thrown out by their families, even though we know that's a reality. And I know that, you know, within the world of social work and within education, we know so many queer people of color, you know, you know, get thrown out. But, you know, I think that these characters also, you know, well, I think it's important in terms of writing to not only acknowledge those realities, but then also to write from a place that really centers, I guess, joy and that that and, and centers a reality that that, you know, may be reality for other people. I don't know. Yeah, I'm affirming. Right no, I, yeah, mean, yeah. I think that's yeah. it's important to affirm that there are families that like not every like Latin person or black person that comes out is like Judge. shunned by their family, just like in any other community where like our families embrace us. And that I think, as you say, like I said, it's important to reflect those experiences that are not positive and that those are realities that exist as well is important to, especially for, us who in fiction and mainstream media always there's so much about our lives that is like the trauma is what's presented to affirm that there are beautiful stories of support of acceptance of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of nurturing and of embracing people just as they are like those are both of them are equal, equally valuable and then there are other issues to focus even while having a supportive family you know there are other things that you can explore yeah, and I mean, I, I've thought about this a lot, especially like in, in the last administration, being an immigrant, you know, when you have, when you're a person of color, like you have a lot of different intersecting, like marginalized identities. And at one moment, one might be more prevalent than the other, because I felt my identity as an immigrant be more painful in those years mm -hmm. than I did as in, in other moments, right? Like, and that's something that you know, can also be explored. There's just so many different sides to who we are. So, and I mean, that's also important to flesh out in these stories as well, that we're, we contain multitudes. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I think the fact that they are written by, I want to say us, whether it's us on the screen or us in the audience, because I think that these nuanced and intersectional and multiple identity stories are really important. And I think it's important, you know, there's this author named Pearl Clegg, who I read and Chaz and I have met her and talked with her a lot. And, you know, she, she speaks of the importance of us telling our own stories, representing our communities and things like that, because it's important for us to do it so that it doesn't get written, not in a good way by other people and things yeah. like that. Yeah, I mean, lens is important. Gaze is important because there's mm -hmm. things that you just can't see if you're not in that have lived that experience or have the gaze to at least understand it mm -hmm. and so we're doing that yay <laughs> so what's next for you well i have a couple of things i'm working right now on edits i have a anthology it's an erotic romance anthology coming out Ooh. in november with a few other friends it's a historical and it's called rake i'd like to f because we're very subtle <laughs> It's a gay romance and it's historical. I'm calling it John Singer Sargent fan fiction, but it's a portrait artist who is like kind of like inspired on John Singer Sargent, the portrait artist, but he is actually, oh, wow. um, he, he's black, he's an Afro Cuban. And it's, he lives in Paris and he falls in love for the son of a, a Marquess. So that's the story I'm working mm -hmm. on. And it's called Monsieur X. Monsieur X. Yes. Wee oui, wee. Oui. <laughs> yes, it's it's very high heat. So if you don't like high heat, oh okay. <laughs> so, but that's what I'm working on now, and that's coming out in November. And then I have my historical that's coming out in March. Okay. okay. Yeah. And then Chaz has got the web series. Web Sansom. And I'm also I'm just gonna say it too. I'm also trying to put together a poetry book. I have so many poems that mm. no one has read and I want to just share it. Yeah. You well, should. It's the time of sharing. The time of sharing and I need to get working on a proposal, but I'm going to do that soon because I know they say as soon as the book is out, it's time to be working on the next project. So yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I like to take my time and marinate <laughs> on my ideas. Yeah. But, you know, I definitely want to be as prolific as you because I saw how many, I was looking through your bio and your, your press 
materials. I'm like, you've done so much and like. Well, I'm very yeah. tired. And that, and that. <laughs> I'm like, I'm exhausted. So. so when do you write? Are you a morning no before work? Are you a night after work? Do you kind of fit it in when you fit it in? So I'm a, I'm a morning writer. And when I started writing, I was actually in grad school. I was going to grad school full time. And so I was waking okay. up at 5 a.m. And I was working from 5 to 7 in the morning and writing then. And then when I finished grad school and then I started doing clinical, I, I'm a a clinician, a trauma therapist. So that gives you a little more flexibility because you kind of can mm -hmm. schedule your clients. And I was doing, and I was seeing clients only part time. I was seeing like about okay. twelve clients a week, and then so I had a little more time. So I had like three therapy days and two writing days, and so that's how I was doing it. But now I'm taking a sabbatical from my clinical, oh, nice. my clinical work because. Let me tell you, uh, the pandemic was rough on us trauma therapists. Oh, I bet. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. I, and, and I know we're digressing from books, but I often think about that, how the pandemic came and all of you had to be prepared to work with all of our traumas while you all were probably, well, you all were engaged in your own at the same time. And did people give you empathy as a therapist? Or I just mean, like, fix me, fix me, fix me. I mean, I, to be fair, like, I only yeah. work with, like, complex trauma cases. It was, like, it was rough for my clients. And and the clinic I work for is great. And they're very aware that we're, like, doing really hard work. But it just, like, I don't know, like, after I got my vaccine and I was like, okay, we're not going to die. <laughs> I think it hit me, like, this year has been really hard. And so I took, like, uh, I said I needed, like, six months just to, like, get myself okay like a little give myself a little break so I'm writing now full-time which I don't know if it's a good idea because I'm just taking on more projects that I really mm -hmm, don't mm -hmm. need to be taking on but it's it's been nice to have some time off because I love my job like I love working with and I only work with communities of color like I only work with Afro-Caribbean mm -hmm. communities so and I know there's a need there especially because I'm a, I, I do bilingual therapy I, I do therapy mm -hmm. in Spanish too and there's not a lot of like trauma specialists that are Spanish speakers, specifically black Spanish speaking therapists. So I do know that I, that is something that I, it's, it's like something that's important to, for me to do, but I need a little break this year. Yeah. Uh, I work in higher ed. I wish I could take a sabbatical, but I'm not on a faculty. I'm an administrator, so mm. no sabbatical, but there's days when I wish that because I'm, well, I tend to be a morning person. I can get up at four or five in the morning and write when it's, I call it the quiet hours. Yes. But my dream is one day to get a little sabbatical just to write full time yeah. at the time I would like. Yeah. Yeah. It's been nice. Although with like, I have a 13 year old only child who's been, thankfully is in school now. And so that has given me a little more time, but was like we were climbing walls here <laughs> this <laughs> summer. So. I bet. So, I, yeah. I'll go ahead, Chad. That's awesome to be able to do that full time. Yeah, yeah. I'll see how it goes. I think I, I'll get the itch to go back just because I really do enjoy working with my clients. So I'm sure at some point I'll call the clinic and be like, I'm ready. Who's waiting? <laughs> Who's on the waiting list? Very cool. Well, thank you so much for taking some time with us today. Yeah, we love you your work. We appreciate you. And we thank hope you. that people will pick up Busy Ain't the Half of It on Bold Strokes Books. It's been out since August 2021. And Chaz and I thank you all for watching and for reading and uh, for spending some time uh, today with us. Thank you for having me. This was fun. It was fun okay. virtually meeting you. This episode's transcript has been brought to you by our community on Patreon. If you'd like to read the conversation for yourself, simply head on over to the show notes page for this episode at BigGayFictionPodcast.com. And don't forget, the show notes page also has links to everything that's been discussed in this episode. Thanks again to Frederick, Chaz, and Adriana for allowing us to share that conversation with you. I'm certainly looking forward to the historical that Adriana mentioned she's working on, as well as that co-writing project. Plus, Fred and Chaz really need to sort out that third book because I'm eager to return to the characters that they created. All right. I think that'll do it for now. 
coming up next on Monday in episode 338. We get into the holiday spirit as we talk with Roan Parrish about her just-released holiday novel, The Lights on Knockbridge Lane. And don't worry if you think we're jumping the gun on Christmas. Roan's got something for Halloween, too. We'll also discuss her Audible original, which is a queer horror collection called Strange Company. On behalf of Jeff and myself, we want to thank you so much for listening, and we hope that you'll join us again soon for more discussions about the kind of books that we all love, the big gay fiction kind. Until then, keep turning those pages and keep reading. Big Gay Fiction Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more shows you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Production assistance by Tyson Greenan. Original theme music by Daryl Banner. 